Hello wonderful people. My name is Carol Vay and welcome back to my channel. I'm really excited today because I actually have my first special guest uh, because a little later in the show we're going to be talking about um, millennials actually leaving the church. But this is kind of a continuation of last week's study when we talked about the lost sheep. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus actually told three parables about lost items. And it was because the Pharisees and the religious teachers were having an issue about Jesus hanging out with uh, sinners and even eating with them. Right after he told the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus told the story about the lost coin. And the Bible says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Immediately after finishing that parable, Jesus went into the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. The interesting thing about these parables is, is that they continue to increase in intensity as he tells them. So you'll notice with the lost sheep, the lost sheep was one of a hundred and it was a possession or livestock. In the second parable about the lost coin, this woman lost one tenth of probably everything she owned. So that was a big part of her life. And uh, But again, it was just a possession. But with the parable of the lost son, it became way more personal for the Pharisees because we were talking about a human being and a lost son, and it was actually one of two sons that was lost. So it was a 50% loss. So this third parable is really meaningful. So this is the parable of the lost son beginning in Luke chapter 15 verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him out to the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he is, has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. 
but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You know, this parable is beautiful. Um, about a, It's about a loving and forgiving father, but it's also a picture of how loving and forgiving our father God in heaven is. The younger brother decided that the farming life wasn't for him and that he had dreams of going out into the world and when he asked his father for that inheritance he might as well have told his dad that he was dead to him having his son say that to him must have hurt that father very deeply i love this parable because i always tell people that god is right there with his arms open waiting for us to turn back to him um, and i can just picture god just staying still waiting for us with his arms open but this causes me to think more like God running towards us, ready to embrace us. But I think that this parable for many of us who have um, children who are adults now, who maybe have left the church, we can relate to this parable because we think of our kids when we think about the lost son. So I'm gonna be right back with my special guest, a millennial, um, my daughter, Adria. So we'll be right back. Welcome back everybody. I'm so excited to introduce my special guest today, my daughter, Adria Vey. Um, Adria, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Hey guys, so I'm Adria. I am 26 years old. I live in San Diego. I love spending time with my family and I'm an artist. I own my own lettering business called Draft and Ink Calligraphy Company. I'm also a dancer and a singer and I love performing and doing musical theater as well and watching musical theater, listening to musical theater. <laughs> so that's a little bit about me. And she, with her business Draft and Ink, she's the one that does my logo for my YouTube and my animation. So I've actually always got her information linked in my description box, but you can find everything there as well. And the reason I brought Adria on today is because millennials who are considered to be born between 1981 and 1996 are leaving the church more than any other generation before them and they actually of all the generations right now from baby boomer boomers generation X to the Millennials are the most unchurched generation right now um, roughly six out of ten Millennials have left the church those that were raised in the church um, and that's roughly about 59%. So what I wanted to find out from you is like, because Adria has made a decision to leave the church, how did you feel growing up in the church and what was it that, that um, eventually led you to decide to leave? So growing up in the church, I, it's, it's all I ever knew really. Um, I went from when I was a baby and didn't you go with me to church when I was like three weeks old or something? Yeah, because I was, you might remember, she was the one that was the miracle baby in my testimony. So I had just become a Christian before she was born and literally put her in the nursery when she was two weeks old. So I've literally been going to church my whole life. Uh, growing up in the church, I had a lot of great friends and I started dancing within my church as well. We had a studio there and I was heavily involved with my friends, dance, and then as I grew older, also serving within the church in nursery and kindergarten preschool class. So I was super involved growing up, um, also going to youth group, all the camps. I was very, very involved. Do you, here's a personal question and I should definitely know the answer to this. Do you ever feel like you literally accepted Jesus Christ into your heart and received the Holy Spirit? Or do you think you were just going through the motions of going to church? It's a really good question. I think I was going through the motions. And that's something that I really wanted to hit um, a point with is that throughout growing up in the church, I felt as though I was forced to do things or really expected to do things right then and there. When I was little, I'm sure there was multiple times when like I accepted Jesus into my heart, but it, it wasn't my choice. It was the choice of whoever the teacher was, I'm sure. I do wanna say that I tried and I feel as though I really focused and, and tried to 
accept those things. And it wasn't like I was just pushing those things away. I did try. Um, but I felt like it wasn't, again, it wasn't really my decision when that was happening. Um, I would try on my own. Um, but I think it's really important for teachers of children to make it a point that it's their choice. And if they don't want to pray out loud or if they don't want to talk in tongues right now, that's okay. And they can always try by themselves or whenever they're ready. Good point. Sometimes it's really hard too when you're around your friends and like you don't want to, I don't know, like it's not something that I ever wanted to do like in front of other people. It, I, I didn't feel comfortable at the time. So now that you're older and living on your own and, and you are no longer serving in the church or attending on a regular basis, if you felt the, the, like the pressure to need to show up at church, would it be because you wanted to make an appearance to the people there or because you wanted to do something for the Lord himself? Like when I was still going to church? Or even now, if you were to go back. Okay. Um, if I go back to church, it's usually to visit some people that I still know and love. Um, I highly respect the church, and I think that just like everybody else believes in certain things, that I have a right to believe in other things. And I think that it's really important to respect those who have chosen to leave the church, and when they do come back to visit, to just be gracious with them and not be like, where have you been? Have you been backsliding? I think that's something that really scared me when I first started trickling off and not going as often. It was like, I didn't want to go back because I didn't want people to ask me why I hadn't been there. So I think it's really important to just welcome people with gracious arms totally. and not be so judgmental of what their situation might be. You never know what somebody's going through. Um, so I think it's, when I would go back, it's kind of just to visit people that I know and to, you know, if, if it's a holiday or something, I love to go to church with you and I have a good time. It's not like I hate the church, you know? I, I grew up in it and I totally understand everything that's going on and I think it's, it's a great place to be. It's just not for me right now in my life. So tell us where you were at as a young adult and leading up to you finally leaving, what were you thinking and going through? Um, so in 2016, I was asked to be on the worship team for college group and be a backup singer, which is so funny because I, throughout like my teen years, when I was really involved with youth group, I always wanted to be a backup singer on the worship team. It was like my dream for church. So of course I accepted and I was super excited at the time, but as soon as I really got into it and really got involved, Every time I would go to college group, whether I was singing on the worship team or not, afterwards I would get in my car and literally cry because I felt like I was putting on this face and that I felt like there was so many other people that probably feel this way or are too scared to say something like I was um, and were too scared to seek out help or, or trust in somebody to say, I feel like this isn't me. Um, I really felt like it wasn't who I was meant to be at that time in my life. Um, and that's when I really started like planning out when I was going to leave. Um, and I still stayed for another two years after that. So I, it's crazy to me when I think about how emotional I was and how like uh, in my head I was about the whole situation. Um, it's just crazy to me how I didn't leave sooner to become more happy and I didn't I was too scared to really to lose friends, to be judged by people and letting go of that fear and letting go of the fear of people judging me has like greatly changed my life and made me such a happy person in my heart. And just accepting myself as I am instead of, you know, how I expect or how other people expect me to be. Mm -hmm. It's like my whole life I lived like this perfect being like, I'm gonna go to church every Sunday and I'm gonna dance and I'm gonna be this way and I'm never gonna do anything wrong. And you know, I'm the happiest person ever, but I really wasn't, you know? When I was preparing for this video this morning, I really felt um, God put this on my heart about uh, millennials like Adria having this relationship with the church. Um, but he was saying that it's just so much more important that the relationship is between her and him not between her and the church or what anybody thinks about her. And I think it's really important for people to realize that 
this is just what's best for me and I still respect the church so much and just as I should be respected for my choices. Mm -hmm. I think it's, if, if you know me and you know how I am, then you know like what a positive person I am, how happy I am. Um, and I think it's important to know that I can seek that within myself right now in my life instead of having to rely on mm -hmm. the Lord. And I think it's a big reason why is because my my generation is so resilient and powerful and know what they want. Um, and just the other day, this is really random, but a car drove up to me that had been following me and rolled down their window. And before they could even speak, I told them to get away from me and not to talk to me because I felt so unsafe. Mm -hmm. That's just an example of like how I can be very resilient and very powerful. And I felt so strong in that moment. And of course scared, but like mm -hmm. <laughs> once they drove away, it was like, wow, I did that for myself. Mm -hmm. Like I did that. So I think that's like a big part of it is that millennials don't want to be told what to do and they don't want to be forced to do something that they don't want to. Mm -hmm. And that's super important with anything in your life. If you don't want to do something, then don't do it. Like, I don't want anybody to feel like they have to fake it in any aspect of their life, whether it's church or not. I, It's so empowering to just be your true self. I, it's very, very important to me. I run and embrace Adria every time I see her and there is no way I could love her anymore, no matter what. But I literally, as your mom, who had such a miraculous salvation and God really proved himself to me and I feel his power in my life, of course we want that for you. And if we believe that the Bible is true, of course we wanna be secure in knowing that you're safe. Um, but at the same time, it has to be real. God will work it out in his way because yeah. he really is in control. And I just want to say that like you have such a heavy influence on me and I get plenty of, of love and, and support from the Christian that you are. Um, and I totally respect it. And I get plenty of, of preaching that's not forced. Whenever I have a problem, you say you'll pray for me and that's so perfect. Just support those who have left the church and don't force them back to it. So as we close today, I just want to say that these three parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and finally the lost son are so awesome because it just shows that there isn't anybody on earth that's not worthy to be saved by Jesus. In fact, the Bible tells us that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Even those religious people and Pharisees that were kind of judging Jesus for talking to those sinners, they were sinning even thinking that. Mm -hmm. They were pulling away from God even by thinking that. So it's just comforting that we know we can always trust God's timing and know that all things work together for good no matter what. Mm -hmm. And that you're loved. I am. More than you know, <laughs> by me and by God. So let's pray, you guys. Heavenly Father, you are so awesome and worthy to be praised. We just lift up your holy name and thank you for your word that teaches us all these awesome things. Lord, I just pray that you touch whoever's listening right now, whether they need a physical healing or an emotional healing, God. So Lord, please touch them right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just give you all the praise and glory and honor and thank you for everything you do in our lives. We just love you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.